in pretty much all of the videos so far, we've been assuming an economic ideal. And that economic ideal is perfect, perfect competition. And perfect competition is exactly what you think it is, competition. But what I want to do in this video is think about it in a little bit more exact terms, in terms of what are the, what are the ground rules we ha need to have to really have this ideal perfect competition. It's important to realize that there's very few markets that are truly perfectly competitive, and those that are are very good for consumers, but there are that get very close to being perfectly competitive. And if we have time, we will discuss those in this video. Now, to be perfectly competitive, you have to have many competitors. So one of the first stipulations is many, many players. Many players. And they need to be competing for the kind of the same buyer and kind of offering the same thing. And so they need to have identical products. Identical products. And remember, this we're talking about an economic ideal here. There's very few top, very few markets where the product is absolutely identical or the service is absolutely identical. But we're talking about an economic ideal over here. The next condition you need is no barriers to entry. No barriers. No barriers to entry. So if at any given moment it looks attractive for other people to go into that market, other people will go into that market, and there's nothing that's really going to stop them. If the firms that are already in the market are making an economic profit, that means that, it, that, that it's, it's good. That's a, it's a good option for people to do. That, that you, can, you can do better in this market than your opportunity costs. And so people will enter into that market. And in order for this market to be perfectly competitive, we can't have any barriers, nothing stopping those people. On top of that, there can be no advantage for established firms. No advantage advantage for existing firms. For existing firms. So once someone jumps into the fray, they are going to be, and assuming that they're somewhat competent, they are going to be able to compete on kind of equal terms with the people that are already there. And then the last one, and this is important, this is important, is that you have to have really good price information, that the buyers and the sellers all have to know about each other's prices. The buyers need to know all the prices so that they can really do good comparison shopping. And the sellers need to know everyone's prices so that they can really match prices really well. So good, good price, price information. Now, there are many different types of markets that somewhat approximate perfect competition. There are very few that are completely, purely perfect competition. But one of them that does come to mind, one of them that does definitely come to mind, is the US airline industry. And the US airline, we can think about these different bullet points, how closely it matches it. There are definitely many different airlines. There are definitely many different airlines. They don't offer identical products. I'm sure the airlines would take would not agree. They would say that they're differentiating on their service and what type of food they give or I guess don't give to you or how much they're charging for the the baggage check-in and all the rest. But for the most for most consumers, it looks like look, I just want an economy class ticket from San Francisco to New York, and they view them as almost identical products. So the airline industry does does pretty well does pretty well on this first point. No barriers to entry. Well, there are some barriers to entry in the airline industry. You need a few billion dollars that you need to either uh, find or borrow or whatever so that you can buy the capital so you can start operating planes, or I guess you could let rent the planes. But either way, you need a lot of capital to get into this business. You need access to airport terminals that you'll have to lease and, and landing rights and all the rest. So there are some barriers to entry. But for the most part, at least in the United States, if you are a US a US uh, uh, operator, and you know, th so there are some barriers to entry, especially for foreign operators, but if you are a US operator and you have the capital, you will be able to be the next, the vet, next Virgin America or Southwest Airlines or JetBlue. So for them, there are some barriers to entry, but they're low. It's not like the government is saying that no one else can start a new airlines. No advantage for existing airlines? Yeah, that's somewhat true. If I start a new airlines tomorrow and it and 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 it's offering comparable rates and, and comparable service, I, I could imagine people would be willing to take this airlines. So the airline industry seems pretty good there. And good price information. And this is why the airline industry definitely came to my mind. Because I can't imagine an industry where you have better price information that at least now after the internet came about than in the airline industry. You want a flight from San Francisco to New York, you go to any of these travel sites, Orbitz, Kayak, Expedia, whatever you want to go to, and you get all of the flights 
listed for you and they're listed by price they can sort them by price and you can actually pick you know you can you can and and it's known that people do this they pick a, a flight that might be five or six hundred dollars but they can compare based on a few pennies or even a few dollars so there's extremely good there is extremely good price information and obviously the sellers have all of their IT systems the airlines have all their IT systems to keep track of where airline prices are going as well so the air, air travel industry like most industries it's not absolutely perfect competition but it gets pretty pretty close to perfect competition. And you even see that in the real world is that it's very hard for the airlines to make really a lot of profit. And the really and you know whether you're talking about accounting profit or even economic profit. And you can see that when I've from this supply and demand curve right over here. So on this axis, the horizontal axis, this is the quantity, this is a measure of the quantity of kind of airline service and we're measuring it in billions of seat miles per week. And I know that sounds like a strange thing, but really we're just saying, okay, in a given week, tell me all of the seats that are in use and multiply those number of seats. So the number as the seat miles in a given week, the number of seats times the miles that the or the average miles per seat. Average miles miles per seat in a given week. And that gives you how much air travel. This is a measure of air travel in, let's say, in the US in that week. And on this axis, this is the price. This is price per, and this should actually say price per seat mile. Price per seat mile. And of course, you have your supply curve right over here. This is your supply curve. At first, to, to start providing those those first few miles, it's relative. The airlines are doing are willing to do that relatively in, inexpensively. Maybe they're finding it from the most obvious airports that maybe the the landing rights are cheaper or it's cheaper to lease things or whatever. But as they start doing running more and more and more routes, maybe between smaller and smaller cities, maybe smaller and less efficient planes, it starts to become more and more expensive for them to supply those incremental miles. And obviously on the demand side, if air travel is very, very expensive, very few people are going to want to travel. There's going to be very little travel that happens. If it's very cheap, many people are going to want to, many people are going to want to travel. Now let's say that this is this is where the market is right now. Obviously, we have an equilibrium price. We have an equilibrium price right over there, and then we have an equilibrium quantity of seat miles. But let's say Let's say that the price level in order for the players to actually have an economic profit is over here. So it is right over here. So this is the price needed. This is the price price needed for for zero economic profit or you could say for neutral economic profit or you could even say for normal profit for economic economic profit profit to be equal to 0. So at that point if if that was if if that is the price then then the firms that are offering airline travels they're kind of neutral between shutting down and continuing to offer service. But notice the way I've drawn it here that is substantially lower than the current equilibrium price. So what this is saying is since the current equilibrium price is a good bit higher than this or it's just higher at all these firms in the market right now are generating economic profit, definitely positive economic profit. So what's happening? If there's positive economic profit, that means that there's an incentive for other firms to add to, to enter into to enter into this industry. So what's going to happen is this is going to be the supply curve right at that moment, but as soon as another carrier realizes that they can, or any of the carriers realize they can offer uh, more, uh, and it doesn't even have to be new carriers entering, it could be existing carriers just offering maybe buying more planes or offering more routes, then maybe a little bit later the supply curve shifts like this. The supply curve shifts like that, and then this would be our new equilibrium price. And But we're still making economic profit because our new equilibrium price is still is still higher than the price needed for zero economic profit. So still more people will continue to enter. And so then you might have a new supply curve that looks like this. And now this is our new equilibrium price. And notice what's happening. We're traveling uh, we're traveling down to the right along the demand curve. As as more supply comes on, we're obviously increasing the quantity and the price is going down. But still, the equilibrium price is higher than than this this line right over here, so even more people will enter. Well, even more people will enter until we get to that point right over there. And at that point, now the equilibrium price is the price at which all of the players are having zero economic profit. 
and there's no incentive for more more people to enter into it because then the equilibrium price will go down or there essentially right now economic profit is zero so everyone is neutral in this scenario so i want to leave you there this is what happens with perfect competition that there's there's no barriers to entry more people go in and in and in the price goes down the quantity will go up in this scenario but what i want to do in the next video is think about what if we didn't have perfect competition and especially what happens if we have something like something like i don't know something like a monopoly